This is Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on a chest. Get on a mandate. Get it on and welcome the best hour or so in the universe. It's Reasonable Doubt. Mark Garagos, Adam Carolla here. Mark is zooming in. Mark is going to pop on any moment now. I've started without him because my schedule is so fucking insane lately that I literally don't have the two and a half minutes in between whatever the fuck it is I'm doing to actually wait like a normal person for normal people. So, Gary... You're better at this than we all are anyway, and you probably have some stories because I know you and Mark correspond, and you send him, um, he sends you stories, and you send him ideas, so as we're waiting for Mark to pop up, we can talk about some of the, tee up some of the stuff we're going to talk about. Certainly. I mean, obviously, the uh, Bill Cosby thing has been something we've been covering very closely. Um, You know, the big news today and and as of late is that he was found uh to have to pay this woman five hundred thousand dollars um mark wants to talk about uh some of the uh some of the ways that the la times covered that but i think also what's been underreported is some of the stuff that happened on friday where the judge basically had to resit a juror dismiss the foreman and have them start their deliberations completely over because they had reached the time limit and there was no money in the budget for the sheriffs that operate the courthouse to do overtime. So basically, wow. it was insane. I mean, the jury was pretty much almost done. They came back and there was some errors, a la Johnny Depp, where they didn't fill in this on the form and it wasn't going to. And then the sheriff's deputies came in and went, "No, no, you're done." The judge had already promised the foreperson that they could be dismissed, so he resat one of the alternates and basically told them to deliberate again, starting on Monday. Well, it looks like uh, Mark has joined us. You haven't missed anything, Mark. We're just setting the table for subjects we're talking about. You're in your home office. Why don't you check your mic? Yeah, Mark, you appear to be muted on Zoom there. So uh, lower left corner, why don't you check on that? I, uh, thank you. I went from one one Zoom to another. I had muted uh, the other. But Gary gave a pretty good description. I mean, the, the jury in that case in Santa Monica and Judge Carlin's court came back and at first said they were deadlocked last week. And he sent them back in. And then Gary is right. After they got sent back in or out, depending on how you want to look at it, um, they were then summarily booted and he had to have them start over again, which they did. And apparently by some reports, um, they were hung again, even with the new juror and the newly constituted jury, which is... I don't think surprising, I think, but it does, I think, tell you a lot. I mean, this is in presumably Santa Monica, where you would think that would be a jury that would uh, be sympathetic to the accuser. You have Gloria Allred's partner, Nate Goldberg, trying the case in Santa Monica. I don't know how much Gloria participated, if at all, but maybe she was in the courtroom and they, they came back with 500 grand, but they did not. I found this to be interesting. Just like the jury and Johnny Depp did not find that Johnny Depp's lawyer was malicious and did not give uh, Amber any punitive damages, even though they awarded her compensatory damages of two million bucks here, they awarded 500 grand, but did not find that that Cosby's conduct was malicious or oppressive such that there were punitive damages awarded. That's, I think to anybody who's following this, uh, that's shocking. How do you arrive at 500 grand? Because my feeling is, is if it didn't happen, you get zero. If it did happen, you get $10 million. Where does the 500 grand, how do you arrive at that number? I believe Gary can, was looking for this. I, my guess is, is that there were, that it was not a unanimous verdict. And that they were able to peel off that when they send in something saying it's a hung jury, uh, generally in a civil case, that means you have to get nine votes for your side to win. And three people is uh, on the other side. So it looks like to me, I'm going to take a wild guess, and this is speculation, that there were four or more people who were not buying what 
the accuser was selling. And finally, to get the hell out of there, there was a compromise verdict. And the compromise verdict is, okay, we'll, two of us will switch our votes so it's not a hung jury. We're not going to get sent out again. We've been deliberating this since last week. And we're going to compromise and we're going to give 500 grand. We're not going to find punitives. And if that's what happened, um, and if you can find that in a way that you could get that admissible into evidence, because that's a whole separate discussion, the jury deliberations, um, that it was a compromise verdict and may not hold up. In one of the articles that I've been working off of, it says that Cosby got in touch with the two jurors who sided with him. So that suggests that at least two jurors, and the way it's written, it suggests that only two sided with him, and Cosby has since been in contact with them to thank them for upholding the rule of law. Hmm. Which would make sense because you get a verdict... You can get a verdict against you if nine out of the 12 vote against you. So and the reason I suggested four is because when they say it's a hung jury, nine to three would not have been a hung jury. Eight to four would have been. What uh, and on a case like this, how do you separate Cosby's reputation over the last 10 years or seven years coming in there and try to find an impartial jury? How could you? And and I so I know it's all about jury selection. I know it's all about vetting. And I know there's a lot of like, are you familiar with Mr. Cosby? Have you heard of the case? But I mean, who hasn't heard of Bill Cosby and what he's been up to over the last decade? And then how would you possibly vet that jury? Well, you know, there's also another underlying um, kind of irony, I guess, if this is tried in the Santa Monica courthouse. Uh, where I think that's where Judge Carlin sits. Yeah, it's the same courthouse more than 20 years ago where the person who killed his son was tried for murder. And uh, that was a huge case. And you'll remember it, Adam. Enos, Cos- Enos Cosby. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so I know, uh, listen, I know exactly where I was when Ennis Cosby was murdered because I was driving past the murder site on my way home because um, he was killed off of Skirball up there off of Mulholland. I was doing Love Line for Westwood One in um, Culver City, and I was living in an apartment in Toluca Lake, and I used to drive up and over the 405, and Love Line, we got out of there about midnight, and uh, I was leaving about uh, midnight. Yeah, January 90, January 16th, 1997. I was still living in an apartment. I hadn't bought a house or anything. It was early days of radio for me. And I used to take the 10 to the 405 and go up and over the hill, down to the Ventura, and uh, off to Toluca Lake every night. And he was killed you know, around 1230 at night, 1245, you know, whatever, after midnight, before 1 a.m. And I was literally driving down the freeway, passing by. He was up top, got a flat tire, had the Russian guy, just sort of young teen guy, just come up and kill him just completely senselessly. And people who... Didn't live in L.A. Maybe, you know, it's a, I don't want to make a wide generalization. It was a big, big deal in real time. I mean, this was a huge case. I Ironically, uh, out of nowhere, and the reason I kind of thought of this, I'd seen a lawyer who defended him, who's now a judge downtown last Friday, um, didn't talk about the case. But it just occurred to me, you know, that it, Bill Cosby is an interesting figure when you think about it. I mean, he was tried in the criminal case in Philadelphia which he has been kind of a kind of a favorite son in Philadelphia, given his association with Temple for many years. And now he's tried in the civil case uh, or in a related civil case, when you talk about an accuser in Santa Monica, where he had undergone 25 years ago, almost exactly uh, the uh, death and the murder of his son in the subsequent trial. So there, you know, there's, and he was a beloved figure for a long period of time in American culture, beloved. And uh, so there's the cross currents of this are amazing. Kudos are hatch off 
to the lawyer who tried that case, because any way you look at it, and I, I know Gary had sent me the article that at least it was reported, he said, booyah, when he heard, and you know, was uh, considered it a win. I believe that the same lawyer who tried the civil case was the lawyer who actually won the appeal in the criminal case for him. So he's uh, he's got to believe that he's got somebody he'd like to keep on speedy dial. Uh, what else you got, Gary? Other cases? We got a ton that Mark and I have been sending back and forth, but I guess I would be interested to hear what he's most excited to talk about. You know, I'm I'm very I'm, I'm kind of enthralled with what's happening with the um, the various reporting in the media, kind of uh, speculation over the January six hearings and all of the breathless talk about whether there's going to be a criminal referral, whether the, Trump's going to be indicted and, and all of the back and forth. It, it, it occurred to me um, that last night I heard I was watching uh, one of the cable channels and somebody was talking about Ron Johnson, who, um, let me just say at the outset, couldn't be more diametrically opposed um, ideologically from me than anyone, but they were talking about the fact that his chief of staff had offered to deliver the um, fake electors, if you will, that's what they call it, the fake electors to the vice president's, uh, then vice president Pence's chief of staff. And I listened to some of the talking heads saying, oh, Ron, Ron Johnson's now running away from it. Uh, you know, boy, he's in the headlights. Uh, you know, he's got a fear for criminal. He's got no defense. That's why he's trying to throw it on chief of staff. And I'm thinking, how can you say he, first of all, how can you say he's got no defense? Because it, it, part of what they're talking about makes no sense. But second of all, there's something in the Constitution called the Privileges and Immunities Clause. And he is a politician who's actually in the House talking about a role in the House. And for somebody to actually articulate to the kind of Democratic uh, amen choir that he's got no defense and not talk about privileges and immunities to me just shows kind of the cheerleading aspect of this and the fact that there's nobody even talking on it from a legal standpoint what the legalities are of these things then second of all and i'll throw it to you adam is they keep talking about the criminal referral and the doj and why isn't the doj acting and blah 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 but Remember something, there's also, you've got all of these witnesses and people want a referral to the Department of Justice. I'm old enough to remember Ollie North and Iran Contra, and there is case law about whether the, the Department of Justice hearings and putting these witnesses on and publicly showing these witnesses testimony and whether or not that does damage to subsequent criminal prosecutions, which in the Ollie North case, um, was an issue, a live issue. But it's almost as if we, number one, we have no memory. And number two, nobody wants to look at the legal issues. They'd rather just kind of preach and, and cheerlead. Well, I have a couple of thoughts. <clears throat> one is uh, I was watching our own uh, local Adam Schiff out here, and uh, he was on one of the news Sunday news shows explaining that there was a lot more coming and we should brace ourselves. So says the guy who said there's a lot more coming for three and a half fucking years with the whole Trump Russian collusion thing. So pardon me if I'm not listening with both ears when Adam Schiff says there's a lot coming. If Mark Ergo says there's a lot coming, I would listen. And there are many others I'd listen to. But Adam Schiff has worn out his there's more coming that I can't tell you about yet. He's worn out that welcome with me because he said that about Russian collusion every 20 minutes for four fucking years. So pardon me if I'm dubious about uh, what's coming, Adam Schiff. The other one is, is it's a very interesting, I'm interested in the wordplay. So I was watching uh, Stephen Colbert the other night, and he was like, five people lost their lives at the insurrection. And I'm like, okay, where are the murder charges? Five people dead from the from the riots? From, where? You can do the math, everybody. Anyone charged for murder? Anyone charged for second-degree murder? Anyone charged for manslaughter? Give me 
let's let's parade all those cases out in front of us. Nobody's charged for murder, but but five people were died at the riot because of the riot. I like the kind of sleight of hand, like because of the riot. Yes, you're talking about cops who killed themselves months after that, maybe even longer than months after that. Cops have a super high suicide rate, by the way, anyway, and there's no possible way you could connect that event to their suicide. I'm not saying it helped or it hurt. I'm just saying good luck making a connection in a court of law to a cop killing himself 13 months later and a riot and or insurrection that took place more than a year ago. And that's why no one even attempts. But you have to think about the news. All the fucking partisan yahoos are talking about people were killed, cops were murdered. Okay, Where's the murder charges? And if you don't hear any murder charges, then it didn't happen. So shut the fuck up and stop telling. And the other guy had a fucking stroke in his office for the love of Christ. So please stop well, working. The and way, here's the scary part. It's not part, you know, it's it's, it's not Joy Reid on MSNBC anymore. It's CBS, you know, evening news where five people lost their lives because of the riot. Be careful, people, because they're feeding a lot of weird info to you. But oh, again, always just look to... Are they charging anyone with murder? And if the answer is no, and I don't think they're charging anyone with second degree or manslaughter or anything even close to murder. So how did these five people lose their lives? I'd say there's enough scrutiny that uh, if somebody was responsible, they would be charged. Well, I'm actually surprised, but uh, I think the cooler heads have prevailed that somebody didn't try to what I would call bootstrap a manslaughter charge. You could always bootstrap an involuntary manslaughter when you you may not have had the mental state, but they would say you participated, you exhorted people to break through the windows, and then somebody died. But you've kind of hit on the legal impediment to that. There is a break in causation. You can't show that the whatever act presumably was the proximate cause was the legal direct cause for the death and you know it was a, it, a, a yeah yeah sorry for cutting you off especially when you're telling me how right i was but uh modesty prevents me <laughs> you know it's a little it's just a, you, yeah you know it's a little known part of this that always kind of makes me smile is when the news was running with the, he was bludgeoned with a fire extinguisher. I mean, that, that was perfect. They love that narrative. That is a perfect narrative. Not that they would do any actual journalism or reporting or anything, but uh, Officer Sicknick was uh, bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher. And there was a whole like, yeah, that's good. Oh, man, that is good. We're all running with that shit. And they all ran with it. And then much to their disappointment, he wasn't bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher. They were so devastated by the fact that that officer wasn't killed with a fire extinguisher. But people forget they weren't done. They then shifted to bear spray. Remember, there was about a 10 minute. Remember that, Gary? For about 10 minutes, they're like, hmm. Well, we'd all hoped and dreamed and prayed he was killed with a fire extinguisher because that is just red meat. But uh, fuck, what do we do now? I got it. Bear spray. How's that work? Well, he had a stroke or a heart attack or something in his office. Yeah. Well, what if he got bear sprayed down in the Capitol Rotunda there and then he went back to his office and that's where he had the stroke. Why don't we why don't we run with that one? That's good. That's a downgrade. I mean, anything but the truth. Right. I mean, we need something spectacular because we're trying to build some fucking we're trying to make rock soup out of this thing. And we have we have no bodies. We have no body count here. We got to make. Oh, Bob, we do have a body count. Who's that? Remember that chick that was shot by you're fired. Get out of the newsroom. I don't want to talk about her anymore. I don't know. She was coming in and the cop was black and get the fuck out of here with that. I don't want anything with that. I thought we were into police brutality. You know, that, 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 wrong optics. I don't want to fucking hear about, but he shot her. We're into gun violence. You're fired. Get the, get your box, your cardboard box with the wood grain in it. Put your potted plant in it. Get the fuck out of here. 
So anyway, he can't just go back to his office and have keel over. That's no good thematically. So what if he was hit with bear spray? I don't even know what happened to bear spray. I was sort of like, all right, if he was hit with bear spray and had a reaction to it, now we're back in the manslaughter realm. Except for no one's up for manslaughter and there is no more talk of bear spray. So they let that one go, too. They also had, yes, Gary. Oh, no, I was just uh, waiting to see if you wanted me to jump in. He's He did die of natural causes. That was the official determination. All right. Well, someone should tell the news outlets to not count him <laughs> amongst the bodies that were claimed from the insurrection. Someone's, you know anyone at NBC or USA Today or the LA Times you could get hold of a year and a fucking half later and explain to them, hey, stop counting this guy. It was someone who was killed by the mob. He had a heart attack in his office. All right. Speaking of the LA Times, Gary, what did we just get sent that was just precious? What was it? Why don't we just tease it? it? We've got oh. some, some great stuff from the LA Times, but Adam's got some business to do. American okay. Hartford Gold, inflation at a 40 year high, interest rates uh, skyrocketing. Experts like JP Morgan CEO Jamie yep. Dimon, and uh, they, well, they predict a recession using terms like economic hurricane are coming. Protect your future, like I did. Give them a call. American Hartford Gold. They'll help protect your savings and your retirement by diversifying your portfolio with physical gold and silver. One short phone call and they'll have uh, you'll have some physical gold and or silver delivered right to your door or inside your IRA or 401k. Highest rated firm in the country, A plus rating from the triple B. Uh, also, thousands of satisfied customers and clients as well. Give them a call right now for up to fifteen hundred bucks of free silver on your first order. Right, Gary? That's right. Call eight six six eight two eight eight nine nine two. That's eight six six eight two eight. 8992 or text doubt to 998899. Again, that's 866 828 8992 or text DOUBT to 998899. All right, so what did the LA Times do this time? Well, the LA Times has done some fun headlines today when it comes to uh, Bill Cosby. I'm going to put them up here. Sorry, it's going to take me a second to uh, get them on the screen so that Mark can see them as well. I'll pick a prediction. Guilty Bill Cosby found innocent. <laughs> found guilty. Guilty. Oh, that's I right. didn't know he was on trial for in Santa Monica, criminal trial. Did you know that? No, Bill Cosby found guilty of sexually abusing teen in 1970s. But he was not. Yeah, you would think, well, they, by the way, the moments night, later. Well, here we go. Correct. <laughs> Correction. Bill Cosby is found liable in a civil case for the 1970s sexual abuse of a teen. I know. I There's a whole new n- angle with the news, which is here's what we wish happened, except for here's what happened, which is. I was just, that's why I wanted this up there. This proves your point, doesn't it? It's, it is infected the entire down to the headline writer who probably still doesn't know what the difference is. Right. Yeah. It's the news outlets can't be in the business of hoping for certain things. They just have to be in the business of reporting what factually happened and that you can get things wrong every once in a while, but there is a, you know, there's a, there's a weird kind of time we're living in because we are, we're living in a database, you know, your, your phone has more information in it than every library combined, uh, you know, hundred years ago and blah, blah, blah. Yet we're still in a kind of myth, wives tale and urban lore. Um, we're in a kind of urban lore period in the midst of all the calculating and all the information, which is strange to me. So like if you stopped your average citizen and said, uh, Brianna Taylor, how was she killed? They'd go, uh, cop shot her while she was sleeping. You go, all right. And then probably eight out of 10 people 
if they were familiar with the name, would go, yeah, that woman, she got shot while she was sleeping. Well, she wasn't sleeping when she was shot. I'm not justifying it, but it wasn't her being shot while she was asleep. That's just a tale that the L.A. Times and CNN would love to tell. Unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. It's probably pretty easy to figure out ballistically, like, how someone was shot. There's a lot of, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't take Dr. Bodden to figure this one out, but there it is. And there we go. And, uh, there it is. That that's, that's Kyle Rittenhouse. Oh, he, he got the gun and he brought it across straight state lines. His mom drove him. I mean, it, they just keep going and going and going every once in a while. There's a Jesse Smollett thing where we sort of stop and we go, eh, we're, we're going to correct. But by and large, these are just kind of become these sort of urban myths, whether they happened or not. And that's a kind of weird, scary time to be in, but also to live in it at exactly the same time we have a computer and all the information in the world. This isn't one guy rode his horse to the next town and fucked up the Breonna Taylor story. (laughs) This is CNN fucked up the Breonna Taylor story, although they didn't fuck it up. They kind of did it on purpose and job well done. That's... That's what the uh, that's the official story now. I mean, you must have run into a shitload of that with like Scott Peterson, right? I would would say, I mean, the the, the, I've told this story so many times. You you could sit there and debunk every piece of urban lore, and then at the end of it, I could have twenty a twenty minute discussion, and then and it was usually young professional white women who at the end of it would just say, I don't care what you say. <laughs> I, uh, I had an ex-boyfriend just like him and that's it. And I'm, and they just, and you could just see the curtain coming down. And that was, that was the end of that. And it's you, there is no give and take. There is no discussion. You can't have a discussion. It's just, I know what I know. And I'm going to, I'm going to believe that no matter what anybody else tells me. And when, no matter what other facts, quote unquote, I'm given. Uh, Gary, what else you got? Well, Mark sent me an article over the weekend. I don't even know if he wanted to talk about it, but I think you'll really like it because it is titled The End of the Millennial Lifestyle Subsidy. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting article about kind of the macroeconomics of services like DoorDash and Uber and uh, Grubhub and all these companies who were basically just throwing good money after bad to try to uh, encounter and acquire users. And now that the economy is hitting the skids and gas is getting expensive, it's kind of going to be a come to Jesus moment for the users of those services. And it's going to get a lot more expensive. Uh, Yeah, let me encapsulate this because I think I heard a little about it on radio. Um, the other day, and you, you, Mark and Gary, tell me if you if I got it wrong. But Uber, first off, you're dealing with people with ultra deep pockets, Silicon Valley people who can afford to lose several billion dollars a year for for a time. You know what I mean? And they're willing to do it in order to take over a sector. So if Uber says. Uh, look, what's a cab ride from LAX to uh, Reseda? Well, that's $111. Fine, we'll do it for $39. And someone goes, uh, you can't make money at that. There's no profit at that one. Fine. Well, you'll lose money at that. Fine. We'll lose money because we're going to put the cabs out of business. We'll become ubiquitous. We'll essentially corner the market. And we're billionaires. We can afford to lose money money for a allotted amount of time. Uh, but then at a certain point, once the cabs are gone, we can start making some money. Well, now the economy has gone south and the guys who are losing billions of dollars a year, like they were, you know, just some rich guy running a race team who loved drag racing so much. He didn't care how much it cost. Uh, at a certain point, his business manager just called him and said, you, you got to pull the plug on the drag team. You you don't have enough to burn on this. So now they got to start making some money. But so now is that Uber ride going to go from 39 to 89 or is it going to where the cab price was? Well, I, I think that in the long term, it's going to be going back towards where the cab price was. I'm sure they'll do it slowly so as not to alienate their riders. But, you know, I took Uber to get up here for the Corolla Drinks family barbecue and it wasn't it wasn't up 30 percent, but it was up. 15 and climbing, you know? 
Thoughts, By the Mark? way, I'll tell you, New York City, I've already seen it. I mean, New York City, where it used to be the cabs were everywhere. I mean, nonstop a sea of yellow. Cabs are not there anymore in any meaningful way. And by the way, the amounts that you pay now for surge pricing and everything else are off the charts. And um, people are bitterly complaining about that. And it's also going to get worse because there is a ripple effect that in the article that I sent to Gary, I knew it would pique uh, Adam's interest because now the kinds of things that you previously would just say, I want to sit in my house. I don't want to have to go to work. Um, I want stuff delivered to me. Well, now guess what? There's there, there is a, there is a cost to be paid for that. Remember when Joe Manchin was the evil part of the evil empire? Well, you know, he had predicted, a guy named Larry Summers had predicted that you couldn't just feed trillions of dollars into the economy and there wouldn't be any ramifications about it. It's the same thing, uh, that's on a macro level, it's the same thing on a micro, a more micro level um, as to what's going on in various sectors. Not, not only are your Uber rides getting outrageous, your DoorDash is, you're spending more now for a meal for the convenience and by the way, if you're now having to pay rent, if you are now having to work, um, you know, the great resignation is given way to uh, the great, uh, what am I going to do now to pay the rent? Um, there are consequences to these things, uh, to the various economics of it. It should be pointed out that surge pricing is a hero in the Armenian gay porn community. And uh, yeah, S-E-R. G -E -G -E. pricing. <laughs> He's a legend in that community. So, yeah, I could never, I could never figure out. I mean, you know, again, when the when the cab was one hundred and eleven bucks and the Uber was twenty nine dollars, no one could figure it out, but no one asked questions. You know what I mean? And then I always felt the same. I never do the DoorDash or the GrubHub or the buying shopping online. I find it all fucking lazy and vulgar and I file it under the same reason I don't litter or I don't like to, you know, waste food or whatever. It just feels weird having people, especially fast food. Ugh. But anyway, my family's completely comfortable with it, by the way, but it, it, it fucking gnaws at me. But I still couldn't figure out, like, how do you get someone to go to Taco Bell and order half the menu for you and then bring it to your home and they charge you four dollars like what how does the math work on that how, how i can't i just can't imagine that math working and i guess that's why right? i will say for the for the door dashes and the uber the the food delivery ones much more so than uber uh those fees have been racking up over the years and it is now at a point where if you're spending 20 bucks on food you're not getting out of there for anywhere under around 40. Oh really? Yeah, they get you with the tax fee, the tax, the service fee, the you know the upcharge. It's there's seven things on there that a mathematician wouldn't be able to tell you where it's all going. Let but. me let me give you a glimpse into old guy brain. The first time I experienced my first DoorDash or whatever. First things first, I have begged everyone in my family, please stop this. Please stop ordering food and having them bring it to the house. It's fucking ugly. It's shitty. It's unhealthy. Just go make yourself some food. Or go out to eat. Stop having people bring fast food to the house. Uh, they've repaid me by tripling down on that process. So it is my fault, in fact, for bringing it up in the first place. I physically have never done it. Never done it once. Don't have the fucking app. Have no idea. Couldn't do it if I asked you to. No. If if Look, there's, uh, there's the Italian joint uh, on the corner with the subs and the pizzas. And uh, on the rare occasion I order, I just walk over there, I get my pizza, I walk home. It's all part of the foreplay for me. But the first time I really saw it for what it was, I I opened my front door in, in Mark's neighborhood at my old house about four, probably about four years ago. And I was walking out of the front door and I like, sort of heavy set ish 23 year old woman wearing sweatpants is holding a single Taco Bell bag. She probably got her earbuds in and she's just walking at me. So I'm standing at the front door and she's just walking at me. Now I have an 
old man's brain. I'm like, this is not the, this is, uh, okay, this is not a Jehovah's Witness. (laughs) (laughs) What gave it away, the Taco Bell? Yeah, this is not the Avon lady. Unlikely she's selling Cutco. Right. Right. Who is this person who is bringing their lunch at, you know, (laughs) 1045 in the morning to my front door? Why would you have a bag of your Taco Bell? Why would you be toting that and almost holding it in front of you, like on display and walking toward me coming into my house? Who are you? I, you know, we didn't call a a babysitter or maid or a dog walker. And then why do you have a bag of Taco Bell unopened? Like eat your fucking Taco Bell in the car and then come over and walk the dog or whoever you are. Or get me to sign the petition or whatever it is you're doing in my house. And she just walked up to me and she just handed me the bag of Taco Bell and she like turned around and left. And I'm like, who is this mysterious stranger? Who's this angel who goes to Taco Bell like Robin Hood and just goes hey, around you, throughout you the neighborhood? The bag. Yeah, I was you like, grabbed the bag. I was like, oh, okay, well, thank you. And she like turned around <laughs> and left. And I'm like, then of course my daughter comes out. And she's like, all right. And she grabs the bag for me. And I'm like, you're getting people in their 20s to do your bidding at a Taco Bell and then bring it. First off, I didn't know you could take food from Taco Bell if you didn't drive through. I thought you either buy it and eat it or you drive it through. But you couldn't go buy it and walk it out. That's that's against the Geneva Convention of Burritos. And. I didn't even know how to process it, and now it's just ubiquitous. Just bringing <laughs> junk to the house. What could go wrong? Well, guy, Nothing could ever my, go wrong with this. My oh. old guy brain remembers almost a little more than 20 years ago, there was a, a period of time that we called the dot-com bust. Mm-hmm. And boy, what's happening, crypto, NFT world, and um, along with some of these others, has a, a a very suspiciously similar feel to the dot com bus. Uh, you know what? You are completely right. After all, we're just humans, and we feel like we oh, we want to get in on stuff like crypto and stuff. Yes, twenty years ago plus, maybe we're we're, we're bumping up against twenty five years ago. Our own Doctor Drew was right in the middle of the dot com. And that was the boom. So that was probably 25 years ago. Sorry, 25 was the boom, 20 was the bust. But it's like he'd go, uh, yeah, drdrew.com, man, right in the middle. It's like uh, making, making, we're going to make millions and millions of dollars. And I was like, how? And they just go, drdrew.com, you know? And I'd go, but you have to provide something or create something or or like do something. I was like, yeah, we got employees. We're doing drdrew.com. And everyone is just doing the whatever dot com. And I was like, but how do you, what do you do? Like, where's the product? Like I get, I get Jake in his taco truck. That's a truck with tacos in it. I, you don't have to explain the math to me. This is an invisible thing. There's no tacos involved. What do we do? And they're like, what do you mean? It's good. It's worth a, they have an estimate it's worth like fifty million dollars, and I'm like, just because they took your name and then they put dot com on the other end of it, it's like, yep, hundred million. A lot of the word valuation flying. Yeah, around. a lot of valuated a hundred million dollars. I'm like, but don't you have to sell it to somebody? Who, who are you going to sell it to? You don't have anything, and they're like, you don't know business. It reminds me of, you know what it really reminds me of? I laugh about it every year. I'm a big fan of watching Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett do the their kind of Woodstock for capitalist Berkshire Hathaway thing. And this year in particular, the two of them were railing, especially Charlie Munger, about crypto. And that that was exactly Charlie Munger, who's 90 some odd years old just wailing on this idea of crypto and it doesn't produce anything. And basically what you're doing is seeing who's the last guy holding the bag. And for those of you who also don't have the old man brain, we used to have this even 40 years ago and it was called airplane and you would play airplane. You remember this? Oh, it was called a pyramid. Play- it was a pyramid scheme. Yeah. Yeah, Exactly. Which, and it was, you would move up, you'd collect from the people behind you, you'd mm-hmm. be the pilot, you'd collect all your money, then you'd be out, and then 
guess what happens? Somebody gets stuck. I fundamentally didn't have a problem with it. I I was like, look, if I could get everyone in this office to go give me a thousand bucks, I'll have eight eleven thousand dollars. Gary, you you got in second, so all you got to do is get one more per, or you know, you got to recruit another whatever. Uh, that's I don't know. That's up to you. I mean, I I never really had a beef with the notion of a a pyramid or an airplane scheme in its in its most base kind of fashion which is this is my idea i'm getting paid first now the rest of you let's see how good you are at conveying this to a bunch of other people so you can get paid next and fundamentally it's it's not it's not really i i know it's 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 criminal but there's it's it's only <laughs> fundamentally <laughs> wrong when it stops and the uh, the people that engage in it are no different than the ones that go play the fucking roulette wheel, which is you want to turn your thousand into ten thousand, give it a give it a spin. Gary, I mean, I feel like you view it as a test of you know your intuition and and your abilities to to you know play yeah. the game. Well, uh, I would say, or m- or Mar- if you're smarter than the average schmoo, it's where you are on the. It's if- a pretty good test. <laughs> if if Mark was in charge of signing up another 10 people so that he get paid, he'd do that inside of 72 hours. If it was my dad's job, then he would get ripped off. But is he getting ripped off or is Mark just more skilled and has more connections? And maybe, more, more, maybe both. More chutzpah than the uh, average bear. <laughs> All right, let me hit uh, Geico. Would you love to save some money on your auto insurance? Of course you would, and who doesn't love a deal when it comes to great rates and insurance for everything? Geico can help. Insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, RV, even homeowners, condo, and renters insurance. You save even more with special discounts when you get your bundle working at Geico and use their mobile app today. It's very easy, and you switch today, see just how much you could save when you go to Geico. That is geico.com. All right, Denver Comedy Works uh, South, I believe. Yeah, we will be there Friday, Saturday coming up, doing live shows. Dickie Bear from the Boston's going to be there. And uh, who else is doing? Kyle, Kyle Dunnigan. Kyle it's Dunnigan's sunny. going to join us. Sonny's going to be on the road as well, so come on out and say hi. Go to amcurl.com for all the live shows. Mark, what do you got? Well, you've got my Grand Central Terminal this week. we got Prova, and with any luck, Dirty Taco will be opening. If you're in the Hamptons, stop by Naya and the Capri Hotel. Palm Springs, you want to melt, come by the V and stop by uh, the Gigi's or Elixir out at the pool. And if you're downtown L.A., stop by Engine Company 28 or Tenny. So until next time, Adam Crawford, Mark Garagas saying mahala. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Tune in next Saturday for an all-new episode.